Around the world, wherever American servicemen and women are stationed, it's game time. Time for Sports Quiz. Welcome, everybody, to Sports Quiz, the fans versus the experts, the lively game of give and take in which you men and women of the armed forces challenge outstanding as experts with the toughest questions you can throw their way. And now, stepping up to the question box, the man who'll pitch the posers, the chief quizzer himself, Sergeant Mel Allen. Thanks a lot, Ed Hurley. Hello, everybody. Well, draw up a box seat and enjoy another set two with sports quiz wherein our battery of sports experts strive to unravel knotty problems that pop up in a G.I. Bull session. This week's array of four stars is all set to meet your challenge in the form of sports teasers you send in from overseas. Remember, too, that in addition to their efforts to answer your questions, our guests are divided into two teams, the Reds and the Blues, and they'll compete against each other to see which team can come up with the most correct replies. So you see, it's a double header: you fans versus the experts, and at the same time, the Reds against the Blues. Now the lineup for today's game. On my right sits the blue team. The first of all, the first introduction I'd like to make to you, news editor of the National Broadcasting Company, stepping in to show what he can do in the world of sports, Jesse Mass, and his teammate, that affable master football strategist and coach of the New York Giants, sizzling Steve Owen. On my left, the opposition, the red team, consisting, first of all, of the new director of the Service Bureau of the National League, Artful Arthur Patterson, and his running mate, a guy who plays all positions on a field with equal facility, the Brooklyn Dodgers' own agile Augie Galan. <laughs> all right, now, gentlemen, here are the ground rules. All questions have a point value fair to both sides. These points will be awarded at the end of each question and tabulated by our staff. Each team receives credit for as much of the question as it answers. The team that winds up with the highest total of points is declared the winner. And the prize? Well, it's just that good old-fashioned pride in winning. Now, if you fail to answer correctly, I ring the bell on you like this. And then the question is thrown to the other team for an opportunity to pick up extra points. And each time you miss a question, by the way, you owe the sender an autographed picture of yourself. All right, gentlemen, batter up. And working on the theory that a good start augurs well for a triumphant ending, we'll slip this easy teaser to the team of Owen and Mass and see, see if it'll help you get the feel of things, gentlemen. Sergeant Frank Anderson of the European Theater of Operations points out that the name of Jacobs is prominent in the sports world. That being true, as I name three sports, you should be able to quickly name a proper sports figure by the name of Jacobs to go with each sport. First of all, boxing. Mike Jacobs. Mike Jacobs, that's fine, Mr. Owen. Or you could have said uh, the late Joe Jacobs. Tennis. Helen Jacobs. Helen Jacobs, that's right, Steve. Incidentally, this question is good for three points. And the third part, horse racing. Hearst Jacobs. Hearst Jacobs, absolutely right and good for three points. Very good answer, Steve. <laughs> All right, to the team of Patterson and Galland, Arthur Patterson and Augie Galland. With no malice of forethought, it's common knowledge that the Brooklyn Baseball Club through the years has been called many names, official and otherwise, <laughs> and uh, it's a case of every man to his own choice. However, Private First Class Bert Levy of the European Theater of Operations wants you to recall three nicknames by which the Dodgers have been known in the years past. Well, I know one anyway, Mel. All Robbins, right, uh, they Augie. call the Robbins one. Robbins, that's right, and that was... Uh, that was after Wilbert Robinson, the former manager of the... Uh, right, uh, Mr. Patterson. They were also called the Bridegrooms, and they were also called the Superbus. Absolutely right, and then you get three points for your answer. <laughs> Just by way of uh, digressing for a moment, the, uh, the Dodgers were called the Superbus, do you remember why, uh, Mr. Patterson and Mr. Gland? Of course, I don't expect I can't you would imagine why they were ever called bridegrooms, and I know darn well I can't remember why they were called superb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Well, I, uh, I did a little research work of my own just uh, by way of clarifying it. They were called Superbas for the uh, manager owned, Neb Hanlon was the manager and owner of the ball club uh, some years ago, and he produced a stage extravaganza called Superba. It was produced in Brooklyn, and his connection with the ball club and the show uh, was a, resulted in their calling the <laughs> Brooklyn club the Superbas. The bridegrooms, they were called that because of a preponderance of elopements and benedictions over the prosperous period of 1899 and 1900 when the <laughs> aforesaid Mr. Hanlon won penance for Brooklyn. <laughs> So well, that's uh, a stage extravaganza that they're still putting on out there. <laughs> <laughs> After all, you're a teammate of Mr. Glanz tonight. You're not opposite him. Give him all the support you can. Well, we're off to a pretty good start. Both teams came up with that first one in pretty good shape. Now we come to football and to the team of Mass and Owen. Steve ought to handle this one pretty well. Immediately we put you right on the spot, Steve. You know, every fall, the airwaves are jammed with hardworking football announcers explaining the activity on the gridirons below telling the listeners about the various offensive styles of play used by the teams. I'm going to name several of them, and you must tell us what coaches made these uh, offensives famous. The first one, this is a four-point uh, question and four parts, one uh, point for each part. The first one, the double wingback formation. Well, I think that was originated by Pop Warner from Stanford That's and right. Carlisle. That's right, Steve. Now the second part, T formation, which has grown uh, very popular in recent years. Well, that's very debatable about the T, but uh, a lot of men are now taking credit for it, although it was played when I was in high school. And I think the fellow who did the most for the T formation was a fellow by the name of Ralph Jones, who coached the Bears during the time of Red Grange. I think mm -hmm. he did more than any other fellow coaching the T. Uh, that's very interesting to know that, that as you uh, mentioned, Steve, it, it has been a rather debatable uh, topic as, just as to which coach or which individual popularized the tea. I mean, there are those who say that the tea goes back many, many years ago, and the others who say that Clark Shaughnessy, who, who in recent years had uh, quite a deal, quite a great deal of success with it out at Stanford, that he's been the one behind it. But uh, I accept your answer since you... Well, Shaughnessy around. coached uh, Mel about 20 years before he used the tea, so... I don't think he had so much to do with popularizing it. Was this the first year that the Army used it, Mel? I mean, uh, Steve? Yes. Yeah, up at West Point. Yes. They did pretty well with it. What do you think of the tea, Steve? Well, I think uh, tea will give you a headache just the same as coffee, you know. <laughs> 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 no it's extra points for that one. It's <laughs> given me a lot of them, I know that. <laughs> Well, let's move along. I've got a question I do want to ask you, but uh, I won't uh, hold you up at the moment. Let's move along. The Notre Dame offense. Well, Newt Rockney. Right. And finally, the A formation. Well, that just happened, I think. Uh, it was in somebody's bad dream. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hate to... Uh, we didn't mean to embarrass Steve Owen. Steve Owen himself is the one that popularized <laughs> that formation, and that is the... That was the reason he was a bit bashful in answering it. Uh, the question I was going to ask you before, though, Steve, when we were talking about T formation, would you say, I don't mean to be putting words in your mouth, but when I asked you uh, what you thought of the T formation and you said you had as many headaches with that as with other formations, whatever they might be, would you say that actually the success or the, the thing that might dictate the use of any formation might depend on your material to a great extent? Quite a bit, Mel. I know... Uh it seems like the teams that have the two big tackles and the big centers are the ones that win, no matter whether they're using the T or the double wing. And that has quite a bit to do with it, I'll tell you that. In other words, if you've got about 24 men who uh, meet the requirements of All-America uh, caliber, we'll say, you could take almost any formation and they could play it and win. With deep punt formation. <laughs> Mel, could I break the rules for two minutes? Right. Or two points, rather. I'd, right. like to, I'd like to offer the other side two points if Steve Owen will put his hands behind his back and don't go near that blackboard up there and describe the A formation. <laughs> <laughs> Without the use of the hands. He declines. I decline. Uh, if you give him a piece of chalk and let him walk up to that blackboard, he can describe it very quickly. Well, four points for the team of Mass and Owen, and uh, they seem to be doing quite well. The next question, 
as we move back to the team of Patterson and Galan. The next question we selected, gentlemen, on the theory that it would especially delight Augie, it comes, as you will no doubt guess, from a Brooklyn rooter. He'd like to, uh, are there any Brooklyn rooters in the house? <laughs> at, at any rate, uh, this, this chap would like to have named three famous bonehead plays committed in the uniform of the New York Giants. What do you mean, three? That's no limit to the number of bonehead plays the Giants pull. <laughs> quite a few, huh, Red? Yeah. You're not kidding. Well, I, I can name one, I think, uh, going quite a while back. Uh, Fred Merkel in the World Series game, and he forgot to touch second base. It was one, I remember, very well. Well, that's right. It was uh, back in 1908. I don't believe... Uh, that wasn't course, in the World Series game. It wasn't in the World Series, Series game. game. Series, yeah. That was in the regular season game, and the loss of the game caused the Giants to have a playoff, 1908. That's right. That's right. Last right. game of they the lost season. It, they? Last game is right. They lost no, that was uh, not the last game of the season. It was uh, earlier than that, but they had to play a playoff game as a result of that game. That, that caused a tie later in the season. They wound, the season wound up with the Giants and Cubs in a tie for first place, as I remember it. That's right. And that, that's, this particular game, that caused all the discussion, uh, it forced the playoff. That's right. All right, that's right. Fred Merkel's failure to... Well, there was, there was one. Uh, it wasn't exactly a bonehead play. It was uh, a mechanical error, but it goes down as a bonehead play. Fred Snodgrass dropped a uh, fly ball out in, out in the outfield uh, in a World Series game, as I remember it, against the Red Sox. That's right, in the 1912 and World Series. there was another one when Heine Zimmerman chased Eddie Collins, one of the fastest men in baseball, across home plate. That's right. It wasn't exactly Heine's fault, though, because nobody was covering the plate. That was, uh, that, that was uh, his alibi, Heine Zimmerman. He always claimed that the catcher wasn't the plate to take the throw, and he had to try to catch him before he reached home plate, and they always said that he chased him over. He was in bad shape. All he had was the ball and the fastest man in baseball in front of him. <laughs> well, that's a good answer. You get full credit for that. Three full points. And now we move along to the team of Mass and Owen once again. Gentlemen, and this is a tough one. Things toughen up a little bit here. Through the years, famous sports personalities have at times been moved to express their feelings and philosophies in the most lyrical fashion. Now, your task is to identify the authors of the following coined expressions. First of all, this is a five-point question, and it's, there are five parts to it. First of all, I'll moiter the bum. Oh, uh... Remember that, Mr. Mass? I think the uh, member of the Boston team, the, uh, I think he's a catcher or a first baseman who later turned boxer. Well, is this you're baseball? not. Is this baseball or any sport? Now you're, uh, no, this can be any sport. Well, uh, that's Tony Galento, I'd say, then. That's uh, right, uh, absolutely right. from Jersey. Tony Galento, any time that he had a fight with somebody, he was always <laughs> bragging about the fact he was going to murder the bum. But it all usually turned. Someone in the audience said, but he never did. That's about right. <laughs> Lou Nova, however, remembers one. All right, here we go with the second part of it. If I had to be beaten, I'm glad it was by an American. Who said that? That goes back many years. Many, many years. Well, I don't know exactly. It sounds like the result of a tennis match. Well, uh, Steve, you know? we, we'll, uh, I don't know. we'll move along from that one. How about this one? Hit them where they ain't. Oh, that was a uh, little Keeler. That's right, Wee Willie Keeler. Uh, the outfielder. He, uh, he always, uh, he, he was quite a place hitter, I believe. That's right. And that, his expression was, uh, hit them where they ain't. Of course, that's what uh, everybody would like to do. Is that right, Mr. Glenn? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I have a tough time. <laughs> <laughs> hit them all on the nose today, but somebody in front of them. That's right. What about this one? When you lose, don't beef, but don't lose. That ought to be one, Steve, that might... Uh... That sounds like any coach between halves. <laughs> That's not very loud of so bad. That uh, was said by a very famous coach who no longer is living. His Rockney? name is Newt Rockney. That's right. Kind of uh, gave a little hint on that one. And uh, this last one, I never called one wrong in my life. Oh, Bill, Bill Clem. Clem. Bill Clem, that's right, the famous umpire of the National League who... The other one that we missed, Mel, the other one, to, was that, uh, what sports is in? If I had to be beaten, I'm glad it was by an American. I'll give you this much of a hint. It uh, was in uh, boxing. If you can't get it, we'll give you just... Uh, oh, I think maybe... Carpentier? No, no. Uh, 
You, uh, that, that whistle indicates the half time. I'd like to have the bell rung right here, though, if we can have it rung. That's it. To uh, signify the fact that uh, the team of Owen and Mass missed a part of their question, they get four points out of the possible five, and I'll give an opportunity to the team of Glenn and Patterson to see if they can pick up an extra point. Do you know who uh, made that statement? If I had to be beaten, I'm glad it was by an American. Patterson, I think it was by uh, either uh, Sullivan or Corbett. John L. Sullivan is absolutely right, and so you pick up an extra point. One point extra for the team of Patterson and Glenn. And the whistle that just blew calls timeout, gentlemen. We'll check the score up to this point. Meantime, you take the seventh inning stretch. And now the score stands as we've reached the halfway point. The team of Mass and Owen, Jesse Mass and Steve Owen, lead the team of Arthur Patterson and Augie Galland by a score of 11 to 7. But just so that there will be no misunderstanding, the team of Owen and Mass has had one more opportunity to answer a question than has the team of Galland and Patterson. Uh, but everything will even up before the final whistle blows. All right? As we move along, Glenn and Patterson up at the bat, here's a two-part puzzler that may pose a problem for you, gentlemen, but then again, it may be just the kind of pitch you're looking for. First of all, for four points, two points to each part, in modern Major League Baseball, meaning within the last 25 years or so, has there ever been such a thing as a triple header? Of course, everybody knows there have been double headers, plenty of those, but what about a triple header? Yes, that goes way back. That was a triple header for uh, the last day of the season. And I think that was between uh, Cincinnati and Pittsburgh. That's absolutely right, Augie Galland. Beautiful answer. <laughs> that goes back to October 2nd, 1920, Pit uh, at Pittsburgh. Cincinnati and Pittsburgh were playing. That's the year he was born. He remembers it That's distinctly. Right. <laughs> The Cincinnati Reds won the first game 13 to 4 and won the second game 7 to 3, but lost the third one 6 to nothing. And the third game was called on the count of darkness in the sixth inning. About time. <laughs> <laughs> the second part of the question. In modern Major League Baseball, there once was a regular player who went a whole season without ever hitting into a double play, but yet he hit into a triple play. Who was it? You want me to answer that, Red? You better answer. <laughs> you can answer Augie it. Augie Galland. Augie Galland. That's absolutely right. <laughs> he did it with the he did it with the Cubs in 1935, and he re, he should remember that year pretty well because that put him in the world. The, he got in the World Series that year when the team won the last 21 games of the season. That must have been quite a streak, Augie. It certainly was, Mel. Is that the? Was that the year that uh, the manager drove a spike into his uh, shoe every time you won a ball game? Hmm. We did about everything, I think, uh, Red. Who was managing the club then, by Charlie the way? Charlie Grimm was our manager then. I think he dr drove a tack or a nail into his shoe every time they won a ball game. He, they called him Leadfoot Charlie at the end of the, <laughs> at the, end of the season. Augie, <laughs> during that stretch, were any peculiar happenings? Uh, uh, while well, we digress for a moment here in that 21 uh, game winning streak. Well, uh, seemed like every ball game we won, Mel, something happened. I think we went, in, uh, I think there was about four or five games in that 21-game streak that we won in the last inning, coming behind two runs, one run. And I recall the game that we since dependent against the Cardinals, and it was against, uh, Paul Dean was pitching against us, and we uh, beat them one to nothing to win the pennant. That was, won the game on Cavaretti, hit a home run. That was quite a ball game. I guess that's one that would stand out in your memory. How old was Cabaretta then, Augie? He must have been a boy then. He was uh, just turned 18. Just turned 18 years old. And that hit was worth a few thousand dollars, I guess, by putting the boys into the series. Quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a very fine answer, one we appreciate, and it's good for four points. And, of course, that ties the score now. We all even up 11-11 as we move along. Steve Owen and Jesse Mass come to bat now. Here's a baseball poser really tax your memory a little bit. And like all gall, it's divided into three parts. Good for three points. First of all, who became a World Series star by making an unassisted triple play? Old chap out from Brooklyn in 1920. Well, Wambagans. Bill Wambagans. Bill Wambagans, but the Wambagans. It was against I Brooklyn, that's right. <laughs> 1920 was right, wasn't it? 1920, he, he Cleveland. Played Cleveland. With, with the yeah. Cleveland Indians against the Brooklyn Dodgers in the 1920 World Series. 
Who which, was the third out? Which was the... Uh, Say... We, we're asking <laughs> all the questions around here, Mr. Patterson. <laughs> I bet you know the answer to it, though, don't you? I know who the third out was. Otto <laughs> Miller. Otto Miller. <laughs> he was a catcher for the Dodgers in That's those days, right. wasn't he? Bill Wamsgans, uh, for Cleveland, made the unassisted triple play against Brooklyn in the 1920 World Series. All right, the second part. Name a pitcher who won three games from the Philadelphia Athletics in a World Series and shut them out in all three games. Christy Matheson. Christy Matheson, big six in the Giants Athletics Series of 1905. That must have been a few years before your time, Mr. Mass. Oh, about a dozen. No, <laughs> I'd say half a dozen. <laughs> all right, fine, a, a good answer. And third and last, uh, the last part of this question, what team upset all pre-series predictions by winning four straight from a wonder team? Red uh, Sox, wasn't it? Or Boston Braves? The Boston Braves, Steve, uh, beat the Philadelphia oh, Athletics in 1914. That was the team that was in last place on July 4th and uh, won the pennant. One finally came up and won the pennant. I think that's the instance they always cite as an exception to the rule that the team that's in first place on July 4th usually goes on to win a pennant. Is that right, Mr. Patterson? That's right. George Stallings was the manager of the team and got to be known as the Miracle Man. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you very much for a very fine answer again, team of Mass and Owen. Three good points for you. Now, moving along to the team of Patterson and Galland as we move into the home stretch. Gentlemen, your careers have brought you in contact with many uh, World Series as observer or participant, spectator, as the case may have been, with such a storehouse of knowledge at your beck and call. See if you can tell me the teams that opposed each other in World Series play if I give you the names of the competing managers, this is a five-point question, one you'll have to listen to very closely. The first one, Huggins versus Bush. Huggins versus Yankees Bush. Yankees and Pittsburgh. Yankees and Pittsburgh, that's right, 1927. <laughs> the Yankees won that straight, world. Okay. Yankees, big part. One four straight. One four straight, four straight. that's right, from the Pittsburgh Pirates. All right, the second part, Mac versus McCarthy. That would be the Athletics and the Cubs. That's right, the Athletics and the Cubs. 1929. 1929. The Athletics won that uh, World Series four games to one. I thought it might trip you there for a moment. <laughs> Joe McCarthy, of course, uh, won most of his pennants and World Championships for the Yankees, but that was, a, that was the first Major League pennant he ever won when he was in the National League with the Cubs. All right, uh, what about this one? Uh, Robinson versus Speaker. That would be that Wamsgan series, 1920 yes. Dodgers and Indians. That's right. And the fourth one, Frisch versus Cochran. St. Louis and Detroit. St. Louis and Detroit, that's absolutely right. That was in 1934. And Terry versus Cronin. Washington and New York Giants. That's absolutely right. 1933, 1933, the Giants won that uh, uh, World Series four games to one. Terry's first year with the club. Absolutely right, and a good answer, and five good points for you, too. All right, now to the team of uh, Mass and Owen. Gentlemen, inasmuch as there's supposed to be strength in numbers, here's a chance for you to pick up some points and solidify your position. Right now, I might say, though, that uh, your position is not too solid since the team of Patterson and Glenn have moved ahead of you 16 to 14. Private First Class Earl Turley in the ETO has sent in five sets of figures, each of which is identified with a sport. You name the sport to which these figures refer. First of all, 18.2. Billiards. Billiards, that's right. 18 uh, refers to the distance from the cushions to the balk line. Two is the number of shots allowed in any one compartment. All right, 6221. Well, that's a common defense used in football, I imagine. That's right. That's a defensive lineup. What about this? This is a five-point question, by the way, five parts to it. Six, two, seven, five, six, two. Tennis. Tennis, that's right. That would refer uh, to tennis, uh, the way you uh, call your tennis scores. Five and three. Five and three. That's right. Five and three. The word and is important in that? 
It is. Oh, oh, oh. We'll move down then to the next one. Our time is uh, getting along here. 580, 470, 310. Good old mutual ticket. That's right. That would be horse racing. All right, we'll go back to the five and three. You have four points out of the possible five. And another chance. The opposition is uh, fervently requesting an opportunity to pick up extra points. This uh, five and three, I, I will say this, it could be... Uh, the numbers themselves could be changed a little bit. It could be, uh, I just use oh, those numbers. Uh, five yards to go and third down. No, we'll have to ring the bell on you, I'm afraid, and uh, give you four out of the possible five points, and Mr. Five Patterson. Five and three would be golf. Five up and three to go. That's right, Mr. Patterson. Sure. Five and three refers to match play golf scores. <laughs> and uh, you have an extra point you picked up for your side. That's an old man's game anyhow. You know about it. <laughs> yeah, and he plays it. All right, here we go. And uh, just time for this one last question for the team of Patterson Glenn. And uh, here we go. It's always nice to be able to put things in their proper places, you know. Corporal Ray Schusler in the Pacific has sent in five groups of athletes. In each group, which contains four names, one name is out of place. Your burden is to spot the misplaced athlete, tell us what sport all the athletes are identified with. First of all, for five points. Uh, Joe Hunt, Welby Van Horn, Bobby Riggs, Augie Galan. Who's the misplaced athlete? Joe Hunt, uh, Welby, Welby Van, Van Horn, Horn, Bobby Riggs, Augie Galan. Which athlete is out of place? Joe Hunt. All right. Uh, well, we'll move along now. The, this, maybe, maybe you misunderstand the I question. Can, I, I give you a list of names. The they all one, have to be one, the same sport? One man in, those, in that list of names is out of place. Joe Hunt, Welby Van Horn, Bobby Riggs, Augie Galan. Give him the gong. I they deserve the gong. All right, let's move along to the next one. Dick Metz, Byron Nelson, Dusty Bogus, Henry Pickard. Which one is out of place there? Well, that Dusty Bogus must be out of place. That's an umpire. Oh, that's right. Who are the other men? Who are the other men? Dick Metz, a golfer. Henry Pickard's a golfer. The others are golfers. Other Dusty yeah. Bogus is an umpire. Well, we were right on the first one, too, because Joe Hunt's a tennis player, and the rest of them were... Uh, well, Joe Hunt, Welby Van Horn, Bobby Reed. Oh, Galan is no tennis player. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's right. Oh, you should see him play. I really yeah. had to draw that one out. All right, here you are. Frankie Kovacs, Lee Oma, Max Bear, Billy Kahn. Frankie Kovacs, Lee Oma, Max Bear, Billy Kahn. Lee Oma, Max Bear, Billy Kahn. Lee Oma, Max Bear, Billy Kahn. Frankie Kovacs. All right, why? Well, the others are uh, fighters. fighters, and Kovacs is a... Kovacs is a tennis player. Tennis He's player. a tennis player. All right. Fighter. Uh, Bill Nicholson, Sammy Sneed, Paul Wainer, Ben Chapman. Sneed. Sammy Sneed's Sammy Sneed's out of the place. Others are baseball players. All right, and finally, Sammy Ball, Ken Strong, Arturo Godoy, and Parker Hall. Godoy. Arturo Godoy. He's a boxer. The others are professional football players, and you get five full points, and that's the final whistle, gentlemen. The game's over, so stand by while the official scorer checks the final count. It's been a real pleasure having you. Steve Owen, Jesse Mass, Arthur Patterson, and Augie Galan, and we hope you'll all be able to come back again. And now the final score has been posted, and the winning team is the team of Patterson and Galan have defeated the team of Mass and Owen, 22 to 18. <laughs> now until next week, this is Sergeant Mel Allen wishing everybody everywhere so long and good luck. <laughs> this is the Armed Forces Radio Service.